Welcome, fellow plebs. My name is Sean, and this is Tribunus Plebis. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, let's talk about the United Fruit Company and a little coup in Guatemala. So we are going to talk about United Fruit here at a little bit of a higher level, but also with a focus on its actions in Guatemala with a side order of Colombia, and with a general focus on the mid-20th century, but we'll bounce around a little bit as well. Like most of these history episodes, I find it really hard to figure out the most basic thing, where to start. Sometimes it's easy, a person's birth or something, but this subject can be spun right back to, you know, basically the first European arrivals in Central America, and even further back, probably. Or we, you know, we could maybe start with the Industrial Revolution, even. But I'm just going to go with the year United Fruit came into existence as the starting point, 1899. It was that year when Minor C. Keith combined his shipping company and his control of Central American banana trading with the Boston Fruit Company of Andrew W. Preston, which became the United Fruit Company. Keith had established the Tropical Trading and Transport Company, a combination of Costa Rican railroad concerns and a monopoly on the banana trade from the surrounding area. And it also contained a steamboat line from Lima to New Orleans, which he used to shuttle his banana shipments. Andrew Preston, meanwhile, had established his fruit company on Long Wharf in Boston, Massachusetts. And he had a lock on banana production and fruit imports from the West Indies, and in particular, from Jamaica. Boston Fruit was using its steamship lines to import and sell tropical fruits in the greater Northeast. In fact, in 1888, a Boston newspaper lauded the company for introducing two new varieties of tropical fruit to the New England market, the mango and the avocado pear, which we just call an avocado today, the latter of which they recommended eating with salt and pepper. But the biggest import of all was the banana. And the melding of these two fruit companies, this mashing of two bruised and rotten corporate entities, came to fruition because Keith had some financial setbacks and could no longer afford to pay off his debts. This unholy marriage birthed unto the world a malignant tumor of a business which came to be called the United Fruit Company, and it would metastasize from Boston to the West Indies and Costa Rica and eventually the entirety of the Caribbean, Central America, and into South America. Now, I'm going to be telling you fine folks some pretty wild stuff here. The things this company would come to do are pretty dark and perhaps unbelievable to some people. But not to us. Not to my loyal listeners. Because we know exactly what corporate dorks are capable of here at Tribunus Plebis, don't we? Hey everybody, I want to take a moment here to thank Gary for being a day one subscriber to this show. Thank you, brother. That's very generous of you. For anyone who finds value in what we do here at Tribunus Plebis Media, there is a link to our Buy Me a Coffee page in the description of wherever you are watching or listening this episode. If you go there, you can make a one-time donation or sign up for as little as $3 per month. Please help us keep the show going. These episodes do take a lot of time and labor to put together. The address is buymeacoffee.com forward slash Tribunus Plebis. Thank you. So this brings me to my next decision on how to tell this story. And I was going to save this, you know, moderate to big reveal for like the last third or so of the episode. I was just going to be like, um... Who is it? Fred in Scooby-Doo cartoons when he'd pull the mask off of, you know, you old man United Fruit and be like, oh my gosh, it's old man, uh, whoever. But I decided to just tell you who United Fruit would become up front because I didn't want you to listen to this and sort of feel the horror of it all 
and disconnect that feeling from the company. Basically, I thought it might hit a little bit harder if you knew the whole time. So in this example, when Fred pulls that mask off of Old Man United Fruit, he yells, Oh my God, it's Chiquita. It's Chiquita. That little blue sticker on your bananas with the lady on it. Those guys. Chiquita Brands is United Fruit. So just keep that in mind as we go through this. This isn't some ancient, no longer there company like, you know, East India Trading or something. You probably have Chiquita Bananas in your home right now, or did last week, or will next week. Bananas are super popular right now, just like they were back then, and Chiquita is the biggest brand. So this depraved union combined two different shipping lines to and from the Caribbean and Central America, two fruit cartels, and one banana monopoly. What could possibly go wrong? Well, quite a lot, actually, if you lived where bananas were grown in the Western Hemisphere. But we'll get to that. But if you were an American family, then maybe it didn't seem so bad. At the time of the merger, the banana was considered relatively exotic around the United States, even in Boston where United Fruit was headquartered, and it did much of its business. It was also a little bit expensive, so it was mostly bought by wealthier people, and it was extremely profitable as well. The new United Fruit Company was about to change all of this, except for the profit part. They would keep that. Cheaper and more plentiful, the banana would quickly gain popularity amongst the lower classes. In fact, Mr. Keith, the banana magnate I mentioned before, he went into the fruit business believing that he could make the banana more popular in the United States than the apple, a claim many people found absurd at the time, but which he would eventually be proven right about. The banana also had something else going for it besides its taste. It had a thick peel, and that peel could protect it. But even with a thick peel, it had been very difficult to get bananas from the tropics to the northeastern ports like Boston. The fruit would ripen quickly and rot pretty quickly, and if anything went even slightly wrong, huge amounts of the fruit could be lost. United Fruit solved this by creating ice-cooled train cars and warehouses in Central America, and cooled ships as well, to slow down this ripening and to give the bananas more time on the shelves and more time on the American counters before they would go bad. And once they were able to ship unripened bananas north and get the price point low enough, and by the way, to flood target markets with advertisements, including by giving people children pamphlets about the nutritional value of bananas with their school lunches, the popularity of the fruit took off over a couple of decades to become America's favorite fruit. But I also want to go back to talking about that thick peel, because there's an interesting aspect to this protective covering. It made it an incredibly simple and easy item to throw into a working man's lunchbox. It didn't need to be kept cold, it could get bounced around without being badly bruised, and it was easy to eat. Hell, it even made it easy to eat with dirty hands, a godsend for blue-collar workers everywhere. As such, it became a staple in even the poorer working-class homes after the turn of the century. It did, in fact, become one of the most popular items for the lunches which fueled the Industrial Revolution in this country. So the banana is super popular at this point in the U.S. and really all across the globe. American workers and children are eating these treats by the bunches. Hell, there is even a new industry just for banana hangers for pantries all across the country. So it's all good, right? Where is the bad side of this? Well, the bad side is in Central America. Let's talk primarily about Guatemala here and a bit about Colombia. United Fruit basically ran Guatemala. They almost literally, and I mean like in the truest sense of that word, they almost literally owned Guatemala, in fact. 1901 was the fateful year when Guatemala cracked the door for United Fruit to stick its foot in. That's when it hired the company to run its postal service. And that might seem strange, but United Fruit basically owned 90% of Guatemala's infrastructure at the time. 
And let this be a lesson to all those dorks who think that privatizing a postal service is a good idea. And when the United Fruit looked at that cracked open door, they didn't just stick a foot in. They drop kicked the goddamn thing wide open. Soon United Fruit would build and operate a telegraph company, began buying and building railroads, buying competitors' land and plantations and warehouse infrastructure, and more land, and land again, and then even more land. By 1930, United Fruit was the largest employer in all of Central America and far and away the biggest landowner in Guatemala. This fruit company would go on to build or own about 98% of all railroad lines laid in Guatemala, as well as having complete control over the only East Coast port in the country. So, largest employer, largest landowner, monopolies on the only East Coast port, and by far the largest port in the country, and on almost literally all railroad lines in the country, plus the banana monopoly. Now, I'm not going to go into the history of Guatemala here. It's long and convoluted and honestly sad because of the suffering it cost its people all along the way. But suffice to say, there was a lot of corruption, a lot of violence, a lot of dictators and imperialism and suffering, and maybe most importantly here, a lot of instability and desperation. And for countries like this, which existed all throughout Central America at this time, when a company like United Fruit sunk its fangs into them, it never let go. And it tried to bleed them dry with their nearly unchecked power. United Fruit had so much power in so many countries that it earned itself a nickname. El Pulpo. The Octopus. Named so because it had so many tentacles reaching into so many countries all across the Caribbean and Central America. The excessive land ownership, and it was genuinely excessive, so let's call it hoarding, was justified by the lie that the company required that land in case of a banana blight or in case a hurricane blew through and destroyed their planted fields. But the real cause for these preposterously huge land ownings was simply to prevent anyone else from farming the land and competing. In fact, there are some stories out there about United Fruit buying small tracts of land which were too small to profitably grow bananas on, and they did it because that land surrounded independent fields. And by buying it, they kept those smaller farmers from ever expanding. United Fruit simply left this land fallow and just used it as an agrarian block to prevent small farmers from competing with them. In regard to the land purchasing, this is... Pablo Neruda writing in La United Fruit Company in 1950, quote, The Fruit Company, Inc. reserved for itself the most succulent piece, the central coast of my own land, the delicate waste of America. It christened its territories Banana Republics, and over the sleeping dead, over the restless heroes who brought about the greatness, the liberty, and the flags, it established the comic opera. It abolished free will, gave out imperial crowns, encouraged envy, attracted the dictatorship of flies. Flies sticky with submissive blood and marmalade. Drunken flies that buzz over the tombs of the people. Circus flies. Wise flies expert at tyranny. End quote. To do this, to control an entire country's railroads, telegrams, and most of its access to shipping, as well as to control who could control land distribution and how, took politics. Well, it took bribes, really. And economic coercion. So yeah, I mean, I guess that is politics, right? Oh, did I mention that United Fruit was extremely reticent to pay taxes? because that's important a little later on. So if I didn't mention it earlier, please remember it from here on out. They did not want to pay taxes. So all of this stuff, which amounted to a private foreign fruit company, completely controlling a nation from top to bottom, is the origin story of the term Banana Republic. Take a second to ponder how wild that is. 
a foreign fruit company was running entire countries as vassal states. The control that United Fruit exerted in Guatemala and other states was enough to even prevent these countries from building both minor roads and even highways, all in an effort to protect the profitability of their monopolistic railroad lines by preventing anyone moving any freight or passengers across the country without using their infrastructure and paying United Fruit directly. The fruit company also oppressed and exploited workers to agree that almost defies description. Except we all listen to this podcast and most of us live in the United States, so I guess it's not too much to imagine for us. Long hours, very low pay, brutal, unsafe working conditions, company towns, and all the atrocities which come along with all of these things. Starvation, torture, disease, rape, abuse, and murder as well as just genuine unhappiness. Worker union organizing was literally beaten back by overseers, company guards, and financially captured government troops. These skirmishes often resulted in many dead workers. Basically, United Fruit had created a very feudal system in Guatemala and elsewhere, including Colombia. So let's hop over to Colombia for just one second. In Colombia during the summer of 1928, there was an event which has fallen into history being known as the Banana Massacre. The Banana Massacre occurred when government troops broke up a banana worker strike in the town of Cienaga. Earlier that year, the U.S. State Department had sent a memo to the Bogota Embassy relaying that the Colombian government was instructed to take all actions to protect U.S. interests a.k.a. United Fruit. And that message contained a very lightly veiled threat about sending in at least one U.S. warship and U.S. Marines if the Colombian military could not contain and end the strike. These following quotes are actual reports from the U.S. Embassy in Bogota to the State Department back home. Telegram from Bogota Embassy to Secretary of State, December 7th, 1928. Quote, Situation outside Santa Marta City, unquestionably very serious. Outside zone is in revolt. Military who have orders, quote, not to spare ammunition, end quote, have already killed and wounded about 50 strikers. Government now talks of general offensive against strikers as soon as all troop ships now on the way arrive early next week. End quote. Dispatch from U.S. Bogota Embassy to the U.S. Secretary of State, December 29th, 1928. Quote, I have the honor to report that the legal advisor of the United Fruit Company here in Bogota stated yesterday that the total number of strikers killed by the Colombian military authorities during the recent disturbances reached between five and six hundred, while the number of soldiers killed was one. End quote. Dispatch from the U.S. Embassy to the U.S. Secretary of State, January 16th, 1929. Quote, I have the honor to report that the Bogota representative of the United Fruit Company told me yesterday that the total number of strikers killed by the Colombian military exceeded 1,000. End quote. Up to 2,000 dead workers gunned down by military thugs. And these ghouls have the audacity to be honored. What a goddamn joke for bananas. The Banana Massacre, a massacre over fruit. And you know what? Actually, that's even too silly. It wasn't a war for fruit. It was a war for capitalist profit, a war to oppress, a war to keep boots on the necks of people that these white corporate dorks couldn't even be bothered to consider as fellow human beings. And it was urged on... Nay, not urged on, it was ordered to happen by the United States government. And I guess this is as good a time as any to talk briefly about the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine 
was the assertion that the United States would not allow other countries, specifically European countries and any other established or potential global powers, to colonize or set up puppet states in the Western Hemisphere. The origins for this doctrine were laid out in a message to Congress from President James Monroe on December 2nd of 1823. And to get the full gist of this speech, I'd have to read a fairly long portion of it, and I don't really want to, and you guys really don't want me to, I don't think it's kind of dry, so you can either trust me or Google it. Hell, you know what, maybe I'll even put a link in the description. Anyway, this doctrine was further defined by President Theodore Roosevelt in 1904. At that time, several Latin American countries owed debts to some European powers, mostly Spain, if I remember correctly, but also France and maybe some others, maybe Germany. And these countries were threatening to send their militaries to collect these debts. Roosevelt immediately invoked the Monroe Doctrine and further declared that the United States would use force in the form of international policing power to prevent those European countries from sending troops to Latin America, a.k.a. to within the United States' supposed sphere of influence. This became known as the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Roosevelt would then go even further and turn the concept of international policing into regime change and protection rackets. U.S. troops would be sent to Santo Domingo, Nicaragua, and Haiti over the next seven years as the United States exerted its own violent control, colonization, and puppet state formation regime over these ostensibly independent nations. United Fruit, meanwhile, relied on this doctrine as a fallback and failsafe as it proselytized their involvement with the Central and South American countries as mutually beneficial. United Fruit argued that they got cheap bananas in the host countries, most of which were poor, disorganized, and whose independence was precarious at the best of times, would reap financial windfalls from the association. But the sad reality was the complete opposite. United Fruit certainly saw massive profit windfalls, but the host countries they operated in were left destitute, weak, diseased, ecologically devastated, and operating as the drained host for this parasitic corporation. One truly lamentable aspect of this situation that represents so much in this story is the story of the men who sprayed a then-popular fungicide called Bordeaux mixture on the banana trees. The liquid would come out blue-green color due to being a mixture of copper sulfate and quicklime. United Fruit began using it extensively in 1922 throughout Latin and Central America, and the men whose job it was to spray this mixture would come to be called parakeets because it would turn those workers completely blue from head to toe. Oh, also... It would sicken, weaken, and kill many of these workers because the toxic concoction poisoned them. Tremors, brain fog, migraines, hacking coughs, blindness, and death would torment these spray workers long after they left the fields. In the fields that they left, those things were ecological disasters often being so polluted that they could no longer safely grow any crops for human or animal consumption. Sure, some people in these countries made some money, presidents, generals, collaborators, and so on. But the poor suffered per usual, except even worse under United Fruit tyranny. And yeah, the peoples of these countries did indeed fight back, just like I mentioned about Colombia a little while ago but only to be beaten, killed, and defeated either by United Fruit thugs, host country thugs, or the biggest thugs of them all, the United States military. Okay, so that is our basic backdrop here. United Fruit is formed. They proceed to economically capture various states and brutally oppress the populations in those states. And they are protected from competition and from reprisals for their actions by the full economic political, and military might of the United States of America. 
which basically just allows United Fruit to be as callous, cruel, and brutal as it wants to be in pursuit of establishing and growing their various monopolies and enclave economies throughout Central and Latin America. So let's fast forward now to the 1950s and keep in mind that the intervening decades simply saw United Fruit dig even deeper into these countries and into Guatemala in particular. As the 1940s came to a close, Guatemala was suffering under this series of humiliating arrangements it had made with the United Fruit, both by being forced into them politically and financially, and also by generous bribes from the company to government officials. And I just want to recap a few things I mentioned earlier. United Fruit controlled the railroads, the telegraph, and radio services. It prevented Guatemala from building large roads so that it could monopolize travel. It controlled the largest port in the country and the only East Coast port. It was the largest landowner by many times, and it was the biggest employer in the entire country. Oh, and it had effectively destroyed any competition, had rigged land purchasing to favor them, hadn't paid much in taxes, was actively destroying the ecosystem of Guatemala, was corrupting officials. My God, how much more can I list here? Oh yeah, it was literally killing peasants by the thousands, whether due to Bordeaux mixture poisoning, generally unsafe work, or just beating workers to death in the fields for the monstrous crime of simply wanting a better life. Suffice to say, United Fruit was bringing misery to Guatemala and stripping the country of wealth and health. So let's just stop there. Oh, you know what? There is one other thing I wanted to mention. By this point, the profits, not the revenue, but just the profits for United Fruit in Guatemala amounted to about $65 million per year, which was more than double Guatemala's entire revenue as a country. So by the mid-40s, the Guatemalan people had just about had enough. In 1945, Juan José Arevalo was elected president, the first democratically elected leader in Guatemalan history and he replaced the United Fruitback dictator, Jorge Ubico. Despite being a political conservative, he quickly began a highly popular program of social reform. His minister of defense was a man named Jacobo Arbenz. In his role as minister of defense, Arbenz was a crucial person in the stifling of a military coup in 1949. In 1950, Arbenz himself ran for president, and one handily. And yeah, there's a lot of history there that I sort of skipped through, but our Benz is the important character here for this story. So if you're interested, definitely do some reading on this period in Guatemalan history. It's pretty wild. So our Benz takes office. And he is sort of a democratic socialist sort of leader. And, you know, frankly, maybe not even that far left, if we're being totally honest. Maybe a slightly progressive centrist type, but certainly no radical. But the CIA was kind of pissed off that their boy Ubico was ousted in 1945, and that two moderately progressive leaders in a row had been fairly elected, both of whom were resisting U.S. and United Fruit hegemony to some degree or another, and with some level of success. Arbenz began to institute some relatively banal and relatively normal reforms. And then he unveiled the biggest plan of them all. And the most dangerous one. It was agrarian reform. And in a post-World War II, Cold War era, there were few actions a government which was within reach of the United States could take which were more dangerous than land reform. Basically, Arbenz wanted to buy unused land back from massive landowners and give it to the starving peasants so that they could farm it and feed themselves. And I do want to emphasize that it was unused land, land which was sitting fallow. This is important. So you remember how I was telling you that United Fruit would buy useless tracts of land just to prevent small farmers from expanding? Land that couldn't even really be used to grow anything commercially? This is largely the sort of land we are talking about, but also prime land as well, which had been kept fallow because United Fruit 
just didn't see any profit in it, or they just didn't want to use it. Basically, they were hoarding land. And this is where the United States began to really perk up and take real particular notice of this small Central American country. And rather than try to help the downtrodden, they instead teamed up with the fruit company and began screaming about communism in the Americas. The threat here was that our Benz wanted to buy unused land at a fair price and distribute it amongst the poor with his Agrarian Reform Act. That's it. Seems simple enough, right? You're not using millions of acres of land. The people are starving. We are going to buy the land back at fair value and give it to the starving people so that they can grow some food and eat. And maybe even earn some money along the way. Who knows? This wasn't expropriation. It wasn't seizing land or taking land or stealing land. It was buying unused land at a fair price. And here is where it gets interesting. The fair value that Arbenz was offering was the very value that the landowners had claimed for their taxes in the previous years. You remember how I said United Fruit wasn't paying enough taxes and told you to keep that in mind as we move forward? Well, this is forward. This is where it matters. United Fruit was claiming for their taxes that the land that they owned was worth $2.99 per acre, which was just about double what they had originally paid for the land in one of their sweetheart deals. And this is the land value that they had been paying taxes on for decades. Because who could stop them, right? But now that this law had passed, United Fruit were suddenly being, uh, you know, something closer to honest, but still exaggerating, and telling Guatemala that the land was worth $75 per acre. And they refused to sell wherever they could. I found numbers on this in one source, but couldn't verify it. So please take these with a grain of salt, I guess. But they don't seem crazy to me. The source said that Guatemala was offering a million dollars for the land. Basically offering, you know, that million dollars for every bit of unused land that they wanted to buy back. And and remember, this is 1952, so a million dollars was a little more significant then. And United Fruit was claiming that all of that land that they weren't using was worth $75 million. But also remember that the $1 million value was the value that United Fruit claimed on their taxes. So fuck them. They should have taken the money and let our Benz help his people. In fact, about half a million poverty-stricken Guatemalan citizens would have benefited from this program, most of them being indigenous people who had been subjugated during the Spanish conquest and denied the land which they were born into. Arbenz actually gave up almost 2,000 acres himself due to the new law. It's also important to note here that these reforms actually began to improve the economy. Peasants were able to self-sustain, and even taxes began to climb. But United Fruit was definitely not happy about any of this. About the land loss, about the compensation, about the sudden relative prosperity of peasants who had been given land to till, But really what they were most upset about was the uppity Spanish-speaking subhuman who was daring to challenge their white corporate supremacy. So United Fruit picked up the phone, and they called the 800-pound gorilla to the north, Uncle Sam, and they asked Uncle Sam for help. At the other end of the line, John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State, answered the phone. With the help of CIA head Alan Dulles, John Foster's brother, Operation PB Fortune was planned to overthrow the Arbenz government. However, President Truman was persuaded to not go forward with the plan, and it sat dormant until President Eisenhower was elected. And when I say it lay dormant, I just mean the military portions of the plan. The PR campaign against Arbenz was launched, and it would rage on for months. The campaign consisted of pretty basic red baiting accusing Arbenz of being a communist dictator bent on world domination and insinuating Soviet influence. Well, we were faced here with the uh, obvious uh, intervention of a foreign power because uh, these homegrown parties are not really homegrown. They're being funded or uh, advised uh, by a foreign power, i.e. the Soviet Union. 
The real problem with this was that Arbenz was pretty obviously not a communist, even if he did lean a little bit left. He was a pretty basic or maybe slightly more radical politician than FDR was. Basically a pretty balanced sort of guy. In fact, Guatemala had no real significant communist movement anywhere in the country. There were something like five to 6,000 registered communists in the country and probably not that many more radical sympathizers. The Soviet Union provided nearly no support to Arbenz, and even years and decades later, nobody has ever found any documents to prove that there was any Soviet-backed movement in the country. The Arbenz government, which had been in power from 1950, didn't enjoy any logistical support from the Soviet Union. We didn't even have diplomatic relations. There was no Soviet mission in Guatemala. In fact, after the coup, the U.S. government ran an operation called PB History, which aimed post hoc to find a rationale for the coup in Guatemala. Specifically, they were looking for a tie to the Soviet Union or communism more broadly. It never did find a connection. But you folks all know that the truth doesn't really matter too much to the U.S. government or corporate dorks, right? And by the time the more military-minded soldier Eisenhower was elected president, the well was pretty thoroughly poisoned against Arbenz. Now, I want to take a second here to point out another aspect of how easy it was to quote-unquote convince the U.S. to back a fruit company's war in Guatemala. And that aspect is the personal financial connections which so many of these key figures in the United States government had to the United Fruit Company. The Dulles brothers, really the key architects of this coup and regime change. John Foster and Alan Dulles. They had ties to United Fruit. John Foster, Secretary of State, remember, was a partner at the company's primary law firm, Sullivan and Cromwell. His brother Alan, who was head of the CIA at the time, was in the same firm, and both were financially connected to the company. A man called Thomas Dudley Cabot, who was a former United Fruit CEO, was the Director of International Security Affairs in the State Department. Under Secretary of State Bettle Smith had friendly connections to the firm and would later become Director of United Fruit. And just for good measure, President Eisenhower's personal assistant was the wife of United Fruit's PR director. So Operation PB Success was launched. The plan was to support Carlos Castillo Armas, who was instrumental in the failed coup in 1949, which Arbenz had helped put down the year before he was elected. The United States began to arm him and his approximately 150 mercenaries and exiled Guatemalans while also cutting off all military sales to Guatemala from both themselves and other countries, mainly Canada and Germany. Arbenz, desperate for weapons, made a last desperate move, and that move would be used as the primary excuse by U.S. government ghouls to launch the invasion of Guatemala. Arbenz had the goal to buy weapons from Czechoslovakia. The goal for Arbenz was to secretly, or at least quietly, give these weapons to peasant militias because he did not entirely trust his military officers and wanted his people to be able to fight the inevitable invasion and maybe even an ultimately disloyal and traitorous army. Unfortunately for Arbenz, the ship from Czechoslovakia had been tracked by the CIA, and word had been sent ahead to the Guatemalan military officers whom this weapons shipment was supposed to be hidden from and to act as a check on. When the weapons arrived, Arbenz was forced to hand them over to the military instead of the peasants, and this whole situation only further divided the president from his military. On the other end, a purchase of Czech weapons was, in and of itself, Enough justification for Eisenhower and all of his associates who would ultimately profit from this war to depose Arbenz. The purchase was spun as the Soviet Union trying to create a communistic beachhead 
in America's backyard. And that was all the excuse that these people needed. On June 17, 1954, the invasion, which consisted of about 480 fighters supplied and supported by the CIA, stumbled over the Honduran border, guns blazing. And it didn't really go all that well. Now, as the supposed Liberation Army struggled just over the border, unmarked U.S. warplanes began to strafe Guatemala City with machine gun fire and terrorize its residents while the Voice of Liberation radio station, another CIA plot, broadcast lies about how badly Guatemala was losing the war. What we wanted to do was have a terror campaign uh, to terrify our bench particularly terrify his, his troops, much as the German Stuka bombers terrified the population of, of uh, Holland, uh, Belgium, and, uh, and Poland at the onset of World War II, and just rendered everybody paralyzed. As a historical side note, and an incredibly interesting side note, there was in Guatemala City during these strafing attacks a certain Argentinian doctor. This doctor was at first exhilarated by the action he saw, and then horrified as it became all too real. This doctor had seen how American companies and American foreign policy had harmed his home country of Argentina, and he was smart enough to see what the reality of the situation was here in Guatemala. He would even join with some armed Guatemalan radicals before becoming disenchanted with their lack of action and moving on. The doctor would soon escape Guatemala and go to Mexico, where he would meet a young Cuban revolutionary named Fidel Castro and continue his radicalization, which was really in its early stages while under fire from U.S. warplanes in Guatemala City. The doctor's name was Ernesto Guevara, but most people would really know him by his nickname, Che. But that, my friends, is another story for another time. So Guatemala City is being strafed by unmarked U.S. warplanes. The invasion is haphazard and not doing too well. But the propaganda and the terror of the machine guns on the planes is working. It's working on the populace, but it's also working on the military officers themselves. Now, I assume that these men actually knew that all hope wasn't quite lost, regardless of what the Voice of Liberation Station was broadcasting but many of the most powerful officers were already more than willing to part ways with Arbenz. Many of these officers had come up during the dictatorship or held authoritarian right-wing views, and a small opening was all they needed. That opening came at the end of June, when the army was pretty thoroughly demoralized and was unwilling to continue fighting. The military leadership then requested that Arbenz give up power and resign. And Arbenz would eventually concede, and on June 27th, he officially resigned and ceded power to the military. And this ceding of the power to the military was his last, futile hope that the military may still repel the invasion. It did not repel the invasion. It did, in fact, welcome it. Arbenz would leave his office and walk to the Mexican embassy and request asylum, which was granted. After 73 days in the embassy, with over 300 other exiled Guatemalans, Arbenz was allowed to leave the country, but not before one more cruelty from the CIA. When Arbenz approached the airplane that would fly him to safety, he was stopped by U.S. officials on the tarmac and forced to strip in front of the assembled media, who happily snapped away with their cameras. Arbenz suffered this humiliation with as much dignity as any man might. The U.S. and United Fruit were pleased with the budget price of the coup, but the ultimate cost to Guatemala was very high. A few months after the coup, seven leading labor organizers were mysteriously murdered, and all of the unions were banned. The cost for Guatemala is, one, the best government in the history of Guatemala was overthrown. All the reforms are eradicated. The 100,000 peasants lost their land. Then, what the United States did was to strengthen the Guatemalan army and created a Frankenstein that has ruled Guatemala 
together with the Guatemalan upper class ever since then, and which is responsible for the slaughter of about 150,000 Guatemalans for making of the Guatemala the worst human rights case in the hemisphere. Such was the power of El Pulpo, the United Fruit Company octopus, whose arms stretched across the Caribbean and throughout Central and South America. They ran countries, monopolized shipping lanes, hoarded land, corrupted militaries and governments. They used the United States military as knuckle breakers and as their own personal military force. And they broke the backs and spirits of peasants and presidents alike. And they did it all for bananas, the most popular fruit in the United States. This story as wild as it is, is just one aspect of the power and the horrors of United Fruit and the terror, oppression, and raw, naked brutality with which it bludgeoned vulnerable populaces until they broke under the beatings. The company destroyed so many lives, so many countries, so many ecosystems, and so many spirits over the 20th century that most of them have not yet fully recovered from their status as banana republics. United Fruit itself was never the same after the coup in Guatemala. Its decline was gradual over the next two decades, but the decline was steady. It was eventually taken over by corporate raider Eli Black in 1968, and then merged with his own company in 1970 to form an entity known as as United Brands. But United Fruit had one more nasty little trick up its sleeve. The company had far less cash than Black had been led to believe, and the new company was gradually buried with massive amounts of debt. On the third day of February of 1975, Eli Black entered his office on the 44th floor of the Pan Am building in Midtown Manhattan, and he used his attache case to shatter the glass window there. Shortly after that, he stepped forward and leapt into the void. Later that year, the Securities and Exchange Commission found and exposed a $1.25 million bribe that United Brands had paid to Honduran President Oswaldo Lopez Arellano under authorization of Eli Black in order to obtain a reduction of taxes on banana exports. The United Fruit Company was bitter to the very end. This was the reality of United Fruit in Latin America and the world. This was, at least in part, the story of the humble banana. This is the legacy that we still swallow when we eat a Chiquita banana to this very day. I hope you all think about this story next time you sit down to enjoy a banana split. And that, my friends, is the end of the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I had a good time uh, researching this and putting it together. Uh, If you can spare a couple of dollars, we have a Buy Me a Coffee page with a link in the description. You can make a one-time donation or subscribe monthly if you find you know value in what we do here at Tribunus Plebis Media. Please like and subscribe wherever you're watching or listening to this. Please, if you like this, please share on social media. And I think that's it for today. I hope you liked this history episode. Thank you all. I love you. <laughs>